Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Johan Norberg, lecturer, documentary filmmaker, and senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He has a weekly column in Sweden's biggest daily, Metro. His new book is Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Johan. Thank you very much. Why write a book on progress or maybe now? Why write a book on progress now? It seems like almost no one uh, understands the kind of tremendous progress that has been done around the world in the last few decades. And uh, if you look at the polls, it seems like in Britain, in the United States, some five to six percent of people say that the world on the whole is becoming a better place. In the era when we've almost eradicated poverty, almost eradicated hunger, um, seen a dramatic reduction in war and violence around the world, people still think it's a worse place. And I think that, first of all, it's bad because progress is important. We've seen the biggest social and economic progress the world has ever seen. We should know about that in order to make even more of the things that led to that kind of progress. But also because I think that pessimism is a very potent political uh, force. Um, If people think that the world is falling apart, they tend to become more protective, more authoritarian, more statist. Now, interestingly, I think in the last chapter when you talk about the epilogue, when you talk about how people don't realize this, and you talk about that error rate of 5 to 6 percent, this is this is worse than a chimpanzee. I think if a, chim- a random sampling, if they were randomly choosing answers, you'd get a higher number. So this means that they have a systematic bias in a different direction. Why do you think that is the case? Right. I think that people are – informed by false or at least outdated um, data. Um, and, and where do they get that? I think they get that. It's not that they read the wrong books with the wrong data. Uh, it's that they don't pay attention to data at all. They pay attention to news. They pay attention to breaking news and to what they see on Twitter and on Facebook. And uh, bad news sells. That's the classic um that's the first thing you learn in, in journalism. If it bleeds, uh, it leads. Definitely, because we want to hear about the most shocking, dramatic story uh, that has happened in the world uh, while we were asleep, um, which is – it's a good thing. We need knowledge about that, but it tends to distort our perspective because there will always be a famine somewhere. There will always be a flood somewhere. And then in a glo- global uh, news uh, world, that will always top the news cycle everywhere and we'll get the impression that this is becoming more um, uh, dangerous re- and imperiled, that bas- yes. That basically we'll see uh, more regular occurrences of these things. Whereas the, the truth is that we see less. We have less war, we have uh, reduced the risk of dying in a natural disaster by 99%. But that's a background story. Then you need history. Then you need data and statistic to get that. You don't get that from the news. And backing that up too is is you you point out that people's beliefs about the quality of their localities, like do you feel safer in your own neighborhood? Uh, They're they think they, they're pretty accurate compared. They they do feel safer, but they think the world at large, with this global news cycle, is what's actually dangerous. And of course, back in for most of human history, we didn't have CNN and other types of things, so we get that. But let's actually get to the numbers of of how how good it is. And I've I've read a fair amount of books like yours. Well, there's no actual book like yours. Your book is excellent and it's, it's so succinct and very well written. Did you write it in Swedish, by the way, or did you write it in English? No, I wrote it in English. Excellent. I see. Even better. Second language. So, But it's very it's very succinct, but you have books like The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley, who's, who's been on the show before. But in terms of how much data you put forth, and I was shocked by some of them, so we can just sort of get into the 10 kind of places that you discuss, areas. Food is the first one. Um, how common were famines in previous centuries? Oh, it was – that was a regular occurrence in, in previous centuries. Even in the richest countries in France and England in the um, 17th and 18th century, there were lots of people living in what researchers call a nutritional trap. They didn't get enough food so that they could work. And if they couldn't work, they couldn't produce food. They couldn't afford food so they could work even less. Um, 
I mean, they, they actually didn't have the energy to, to that, work. That's right. That's and, a kind of astounding for me to even think about. Right. And in the absence of uh, trade, in the absence of uh, modern transportation, a local crop failure resulted in starvation and, and famines in, in the richest countries. That was something that happened all the time. In my own country, Sweden, uh, chronic n- undernourishment to, was in existence until the early 20th century. In the late eight, 19th century, uh, my forefathers in northern Sweden, they had to mix bark from the trees into the bread to make the bread go further. Um, so, And we regularly had those occurrences of hundreds of thousands of people dying. We even have records of uh, cannibalism in some of the richest countries on the planet. But we, we still hear about famines today. I mean, the one that when I was growing up is Ethiopia. Um, is it the same type of famines or they, have they gone down? They've gone down dramatically. First of all, we the the regular sort of chronic undernourishment has been reduced dramatically. In the late 1940s, uh, around half of the world population uh, suffered from chronic undernourishment. Now, around 10 percent do. Um, so that's a dramatic shift, but partly because people have had uh, more stronger protected property rights to their land, so they invest more in better crops, in irrigation systems, and so on. But also trade uh, so that you can uh, produce where you can produce the best and sell it to, to other places. And all the technological development during the Green Revolution, artificial fertilizer, um, better irrigation systems, better crops, uh, higher yields and so on. Uh, so but you that's, write that fertilizer might be the most important invention yeah, uh, in human history. It's sadly, sadly overlooked. Uh, the fact that we uh, could get ammonia from the atmosphere, the fact that we could artif- have artificial fertilizers has probably saved the lives of, of a billion people or two billion people, depending on how, how you count. Um, and no one really thinks about it uh, unless they think about the problems that comes with it as well, um, because there are always, there's always some pushback. But that's a chronic undernourishment. But we also have the famine, disasters, where it suddenly strikes over uh, just a few months. And, uh, and it used to be with, on much smaller populations uh, around the world. We had uh, decades uh, regularly, uh, in a decade, uh, some 5, 10, 15 million people dying in famines. Now, in the last 10 years, we've seen uh, half a million people doing that, far too many, um, and especially in, in sub-Saharan Africa, far too many, but fewer than ever, despite a bigger population than ever. And more of the famines that have been in the 20th century have been caused by governments than, than, than they, I mean, governments were problematic before because you had mercantilist kind of philosophies. So if you weren't trading your food, then yes, a, a single blight on your crops or just a cold summer could just cause a famine and then you weren't trading. But now governments have caused a lot of famines. Right. Now it almost takes a a vicious uh, despotic regime that almost wants to punish its people to create famines like that. Uh, it could be war-torn uh, countries um, where no one is safe in producing anything or countries like North Korea where they've sort of consciously destroyed uh, any kind of ability to produce and trade. Who was Norman Borlaug? He was uh, perhaps uh, the, the person who saved most lives uh, in in the world by being the man behind the green revolution around the world because he had that vision, that idea that uh, – you should be able to use the mankind's knowledge to uh, make the yields go further. So he started to experiment with uh, better crops in uh, Mexico and producing dramatic results. And then he thought that we have to try to make this happen on a global scale. And uh, he did so in India and in Pakistan in the um, 19... Uh, 70s, in the 1960s and 70s, this this really took off. And at that time, people said that overpopulation was the big problem, that we'll never be able to create enough food for these people. We'll see massive famines in, in for example, the subcontinent in, in India and Pakistan. Um, and they didn't believe that this was the way to go forth. Why should we invest money in in strange new innovations when we have too little to uh, sort of buy the the crops that we need today. But he fought for this in a dramatic fashion and uh, he went there um, and 
while war broke out between India and Pakistan, sometimes uh, producing and, and uh, working within, uh, uh, and he could hear the gunshots and he kept kept on working. And the result was tremendous. In the first season, they produced more than they could store. Uh, and then even further in the, the years afterwards. So he saved lives of hundreds of millions of people in those places. And then he wanted to do the same thing in, in sub-Saharan Africa. But a friend of him told him that, think about the amazing accomplishments that you've done now, because you'll never be able to do anything like this again, because this was such a disaster uh, that suddenly you had a free range. You could you could do it. Now, um, governments, they're going to block you. Special interests are going to block you. He was very much interested in using genetically modified organisms and the whole environmental movement and the United Nations system were opposed to that. So he couldn't do the same thing in Africa. Before we leave food, there is one story too that I had not heard in your book about a village in China. Uh, I think it's pronounced Xiaogang. Yeah. Would, that, would that be correct? Uh, there's a story about how during the famines in China, and China is particular where a lot of the people we brought out of poverty were previously. I mean, I, I we used to tell children they're starving children in China, uh, eat eat your vegetables because they're starving children in China. And I don't think children get told that anymore. There's a, we move that to a different place. But in this one story in Xiaogong Village, uh, we had a little property rights revolution. Yeah. There were some 20 families who um, realized that for all their hard work, they didn't get much. They couldn't put food on the table for their children. So they th thought about what could we do instead. So they had a secret town meeting where they decided to secretly uh, privatize the land to, so that every family had its own plot and they could produce anything they'd like, they could work as much as they like, and they would keep the rewards rather than working in the sort of communes, the collectives um, that were controlled by the government. And they had to do this in secret because obviously that was the, the worst thing you could do. They, they became small capitalists. So they, they agreed to do this, they agreed to keep it secret, and they also agreed that... Um, if someone was uh, exposed, uh, the others would bring up their children because the others would they would go to the labor camp in, in that case. What happened was a dramatic surge in productivity because people now worked much harder when they could reap the rewards. They began to invest in that land. So suddenly there was an explosion of, of productivity. And it was difficult to keep it secret. The other uh, villages began to notice that something had happened there. And as some farmer put it, um, this is like the chicken pest. If one village has it, everybody has it in, <laughs> in just a few months. Uh, so this secret privatization took off everywhere in the late 1970s. And then, of course, the Communist Party got noticed and understood something is wrong here. They produce much too much food. Uh, the children, they grow Taller, they they're better fed, and and they exposed what has had happened, and then they had this painful decision whether they should reinforce their communist system, uh, which led to starvation, or approve of this. And luckily, this was a period when the leadership began to think anew, partly because they were inspired by what had happened or threatened by what had happened in the neighboring countries, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, the kind of progress that they had seen. So. In the early 1980s, the Communist Party said that this is acceptable. If villages want to do this, they can do it. And in a few years, there were no collectives like that left. And that was a huge part of China working itself to a liberalization regime. Sanitation, which um, is the, the probably the most disgusting chapter <laughs> of the book. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I apologize. Okay. <laughs> uh, we used to be pretty dirty. Yeah. This is the problem. This is one of the most lethal things in world history. The fact that we didn't keep our um, uh, waste faces and, and, and all those disgusting things separate from uh, the water sources that we used for uh, cooking and for drinking. So that killed off a lot of people. And uh, this is something that uh, every affected everybody. Um, the River Thames was disgusting um, in and, Britain. And at one point, dead of life too. 
It had no life in it. Right. It was declared biologically dead as late as the 1950s. Uh, but in the, um, the mid-19th century, uh, it was such a disgusting pool of, of that stank that uh, the parliament had to be evacuated because they, they couldn't breathe there. And um, uh, Queen Victoria's um, husband, Albert, died from typhoid fever, uh, partly because of these these things. So it affected everybody. The, the Royal Castle of Versailles in Paris, which was the, the sort of the prime of wealth in uh, Europe in the 18th century, it was they had spent so much resources on everything, decoration, material, clothes, but they didn't have a single flushing toilet. So visitors to the castle pointed out that Look, you can you notice where Versailles is because the, because of the stench, um, because the, the visitors noticed that there was excrement in the in the wall uh, in the walls and in the um, stairs and uh, why are the everywhere. hedges so high? <laughs> I didn't even know that the hedges are high because. In Versailles, yeah, exactly, because you have had to relieve yourself behind something. <laughs> uh, so, so this really affected everybody, and people died early uh, because of this. Uh, we had a revolution in the uh, mid and late nineteenth century where science began to understand that microorganisms could kill, even though you couldn't see it. So they began to separate those sources, and we began to filter and uh, uh, put various chemicals into the water to make sure that we don't die from water. So that, uh, uh, well, one side effect was that we could begin to drink water rather than beer and wine in the morning. <laughs> and the kids don't have to be drunk uh, <laughs> early in the morning. Uh, but that has saved li more lives than, than any other sort of health um, innovation. How much better is it now than, say, even the 50s in, ar around the world for people having access to clean water? They're basically two different things. Is it clean water, improved water sources? Uh, do they have sanitation? We've made the most progress when it comes to water uh, source and just sort of getting that from a better place or making sure that we treat the water in various ways. And since 1980, we've... Um, increased the number of people who have access to clean water by some 285,000 people every day. So, every day? <laughs> every day. What does that equate to? Several billion? Yeah, so it's 2.5 or something like that. Uh, and that's everywhere where we've seen a rise in GDP per capita, everywhere where people get richer, they start doing this because people are smart. And that's one of the, the lessons that I learned from this. It's not that they're, they're stupid, they make the wrong decisions, they had to be sort of told what to do or controlled top down. The moment they have a chance, the moment they have the resources at their disposal, the moment they get the technology, they make the right decision because they don't want to see their children die. And this is with, with food and sanitation, but then uh, the next chapter is life expectancy, uh, which is a combination of a bunch of things. I think one thing that maybe people understand that there's been progress in is in medical science. I mean, we're not using leeches or amputations anymore, but maybe they don't understand how, how much it has changed. Right. Yeah, it used to be said that uh, prayer was the most common medicine in the previous eras. Um, well, the data speaks for itself. In as late as 1900, the world average life expectancy was 31 years. 31 years. Is that is that a product of the high infant mortality? It's mostly infant and child mortality because the moment you take care of that, you can lead a very long life. But it's also something that has been uh, – we've dealt with a lot of the things that killed us in middle age and, and later stages, even though that doesn't improve life expectancy as much because it only gives you another 10, 20 years. Um, so mostly it's infant and child mortality. In some places, uh, sort of every second child uh, – died before five. And uh, now life expectancy is uh, 71 years around the world. So it's such a tremendous uh, increase. And so if you're older than 31 years, you should really sort of think about uh, how lucky you should be to be living in this era. Um, as late as 1800, not a single country on the planet, not Britain, not France, not the US had a life expectancy longer than 40 years. Now, not a single country has a life expectancy shorter than 40 years. And it tells you that we have done something right when it comes to health, nutrition, to lifestyle, to the economy. We've also done some amazing things with eradicating things like smallpox, which has to be an 
unbelievable, one of the unbelievable achievements of the human race. But there are also diseases that we might eradicate pretty quickly, you write about. Yeah. Like like malaria, for example. How how much better has that gotten? Right. It's th that is amazing because uh, there are so many diseases that uh, you used to. I mean, whoever you were, you had people in your family that died from it. Now we never think of it anymore. Measles and smallpox and cholera and, and the plague and um, awful things like that. Now we pay all the attention to things like malaria because that's the thing that kills a lot of people today. Well, we've seen tremendous improvements in just the last 15 years, um, partly because of the, uh, the Gates Foundation, how they've been instrumental in uh, sending, um, making sure that bed nets were used, making sure that more drugs were uh, being used here. And it has saved uh, probably in these last 10 years some 5 million um, kids from dying from malaria. Moving on to poverty, which of course all these things just absolute poverty rates because food and sanitation, lifestyle, they, they come in. But then poverty rates themselves as sort of an overarching mechanism uh, have dramatically improved. The numbers are quite astounding. But, I, but first I would like to ask the question, which is sort of the part of the lead quote you have in that chapter. Um, why are nations poor? Right? Or, I mean, why are there still poor nations or why, are any, why is any nation poor? Yeah. It's, it's the – and that's really the wrong question. Um, why are some countries uh, poor? Because every country was poor. Um, the the richest countries on the planet 200 years ago, Great Britain, uh, was poorer than the poorest uh, sub-Saharan African countries today, and all their living standards were were poorer. So the question is, why did some countries get rich? And uh, we we know this because it happened in every country that began to give their people uh, more freedom to uh, explore new ideas, to experiment with new solutions in, in business, in technology, and uh, to also exchange this uh, with more trade domestically, but also internationally. Every country on the planet that did that has eradicated poverty, basically, at least in the, the extreme poverty that we, we talk about in, in this context. Um, in the early 19th century, uh, some 90 percent of uh, people around the world lived in extreme poverty. What we now think about as being able to consume less than 1.9 or to $2 a day adjusted for local purchasing power and inflation, but around 90 percent. Now it's nine so we've really gone a long, long way over that period. And this has happened in all those countries that began to um, integrate themselves into the global economy as well. We've seen this tremendous progress in China and in India now in the recent decades after they did the same thing. Now, how much of that, how much progress of that has occurred in the lifetimes of even our listeners? Yeah. I think that the last 25 years have been spectacular. It's been 25 years while we've constantly been complaining about the world. Uh, we've had leftist authors like uh, Naomi Klein pointing out that since 1990, free market capitalism has ravaged the world and taken control everywhere. Um, and over those 25 years, we've reduced extreme poverty from 37 percent to less than 10 percent in those 25 years. So for the first time in world history, it also means that the absolute number of extremely poor has been reduced um, because previously an increase in world population meant that the uh, number of poor increased even though the proportion might not have. Um, so we've increased population by some 2 billion over this period and yet the number of people in extreme poverty has been reduced by 1.25 billion in just 25 years. It's, it's sh those are shocking numbers. It means that every minute we talk, another 100 million people rise out of poverty. And in places like India, which relaxed its incredibly oppressive trade restrictions and sort of socialist kind of government uh, to help create this, but it, but it also had a secondary effect, which you write about which I think is an important thing to point out for the effects of wealth and capitalism markets, it had a strong effect on the caste system and how people were treating each other in India. How, how did that work out? Yeah. Uh, I agree that is incredibly important because uh, when the economy is controlled, you control people's lives and then you also end up with discrimination and other things. Opening up markets, creating competition means that you look for talents wherever it is. And if you're 
good. If you're talented, you can compete with the others. I met one young um, Dalit, a, 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 sort of the lowest rung of the caste system in India, who traditionally would not have got an education or been able to work with anything except the dirtiest, uh, the dirtiest uh, occupations. Now what happened after India began to open up in 1991 was that people began to look for talent everywhere. He moved into town and he actually he overheard a um, contractor who built trenches for the new telecom companies. Um, they had to create more cables and, and stuff. And he complained that they didn't have enough workers. So he just told them, well, look, I can get you 25 able workers tonight because he had a lot of friends in the old town. And traditionally, they wouldn't have been able to work with anything like that. But now, okay, let's do it. He went there, they trusted him, and they worked hard, they got paid, and he made more money in one day than he did throughout his life. So he started a new company where he um, uh, made sure that people got the right human resources, and then he moved into construction and became a rich man. And now he's recently moved into a neighborhood that was uh, traditionally reserved for the, the highest castes. Um, so the caste system is breaking down as a result of this basically competitive pressure, a rise in wealth, but more important, a rise of entrepreneurial opportunity. And we can see that in all the data on uh, everything from um, marriages between people of very different castes to uh, the kind of jobs that they get to things like uh, separated seating at marriages, uh, where, which used to be 100% basically that they, they were separated. Now we see that in many cities that's a minority phenomenon. It is rapidly disappearing. So being able to participate in the economy also gives you social status and it gives you respect in the eyes of others and people do not think as much about who you are and who your parents were, but more what can you do. Moving on to violence. Uh if you've been listening to – we're recording this uh, in October, October 12th, 2016. And if you – so this will actually come out after the election. Uh, so the, the listeners will know the future um, uh, and who gets if elected. If there's still hope for <laughs> the future, they will, hope, know. Yes, they will know. <laughs> but the, uh, we, if, in the debates, we, we listen to Trump's rhetoric in particular, which I can only describe as apocalyptic and his, his rhetoric about – Kind of the threats that the people are facing and saying this is you know a very dangerous world, the inner cities, ISIS, terrorists, all that. So it sounds like he's scaring, or he, at least people are believing that they're highly under threat of violence. Uh, and if you look at 9/11 and Syria and Paris attacks and all this stuff, it seems like violence has gone up. Uh, but in fact, you say it has not. And in fact, it's much much less than it used to be. Right. This is a shocking incidence of where fear-mongering and our perceptions are totally separated from reality and the facts. Um, you hear Trump and a lot of other people talking about violence spiraling out of control, homicide increasing. Yes, but you know, it's the homicide rate is half of what it was in 1980 in the in the good old days. Um, and uh, Trump talked a lot about the um, sort of police murders, which were awful in every single way. But when you look at the data, you can see that even if uh, the this particularly uh, awful year in many ways, if those trends continue throughout the year, you would still have to go back to the 1950s to find an, a year when so few policemen were murdered in service. Uh, so it's an example of how violence is not increasing, but global media and social media gives us the images and the stories immediately and we have a group of politicians who want to exploit that. And it's easy to exploit that because it captures our attention immediately. When you look around the world, there we've seen the same thing with, with war. I mean, some 1.5 out of a population of 100,000 globally uh, die in battles uh, right now. It's a slight uptick uh, this recent year because of Syria. Uh, particularly. But if you compare that to when I grew up in the 70s, in the 80s, it has been reduced by uh, four-fifths. Uh, but we are all 
sort of suffering from what psychologists call availability heuristics. When we think about how frequent something uh, is, we do not think of the data. We think about how easy it is to remember an instance of this. So if you talk about violence, you think about terrorist attacks, recent ones, you think about the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, and you think, oh my God, this is spiraling out of control. You do not think about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in the 1980s, which killed 10 times more people uh, than this. You don't think about the terrorist attacks in the 1970s uh, that killed more people in, in Western Europe uh, than, than these terrorist attacks have. Um, because we forget about that. In a way, we also know that we survived that as a society. Now we're not so sure. We do not know where it's going, and that triggers our fear. Um, Terrorism has increased in Western Europe and in the United States in the last few years. Um, But we have to keep in mind that terrorists kill very few people. They want to terrorize us, and that's the danger, uh, that we panic when we notice this and we make the wrong decisions. Uh, But they kill – their risk to individual life is incredibly small. In Western Europe, the risk that you will be killed by a normal murderer, so to speak, is 30 times bigger than being killed by a terrorist. And that's a homicide rate that's been cut in half, and I'm sure that the American numbers are even more dramatic. So basically, the risk that you'll die when you fall – off the stairs is bigger than being killed by a terrorist. Um, And that puts it into perspective, and we need that kind of perspective in order not to panic. And it's not only the risk of you being put into a war and finding yourself fighting, oh, I mean, a religious war in Europe and say, you know, 1625, the Thirty Years' War, which was quite destructive. Uh, it's, It's your risk of being hurt by other people. But there's also this I mean, people in your society through crime, but there's also this interesting just moral development that people in the olden days, uh, middle, middle, middle Ages, Renaissance, going forward in the Enlightenment, were shockingly okay with brazen violence uh, publicly displayed. That's right. And that's what many historians uh, say when they look at how people act and reacted to war. Um, that that it wasn't that different from everyday life because you died from an early age. You knew that some of your kids would die before they turned five. Uh, You had plague. You had awful disease that killed off thousands of people um, in, in months. So war situations where that happens weren't that dramatic compared to everyday life. And uh, that sort of tells uh, – historians say that, that it, in a way it brutalized people as well because if violence is a regular occurrence and you know it happens in your life as well, you become a bit less restrictive in imposing pain on other people. So you notice that in how you treat criminals and how you treat people from minorities and so on, that corporal punishments were in- – incredibly common. Public displays of of torture, executions uh, were something that people noticed. Kids saw that uh, on their way to the grocery store. I just saw a thief get hung, drawn and quartered in the street. So we might as well invade Belgium because, you know, that's just the way life is. It it is pretty shocking. Even things like bear baiting, which, you know, is have tying up bears and having dogs attack them that is shockingly violent to us now because we now care more about animals, which all seems to be a product of wealth, like many things in in the general thrust of this, which includes the next chapter, which is the environment. Uh, this is a big one for a lot of people. It's When I do a lot of lecturing around, it's one of the biggest hangups about libertarianism and free markets, and this idea that is obviously true that free markets lead to consumption, consumption leads to environmental degradation uh, and so therefore capitalism and the environment are completely at odds with each other in a fundamental way that is sort of unrectifiable, which is why so many environmentalists are are not just not capitalists, they're virulently anti-capitalist. But this is incorrect. Right. This is an interesting chapter. It was the one that impressed my editor the most because he thought that that's something that you cannot prove that we've made progress when it comes to the environment considering uh, everything from uh, biological diversity to global warming and so on. But it, after having read it, sort of, this could be the most in- counterintuitive and most 
convincing chapter in a way. And why is that? What is it that that's happened? Well, in a way, the perception that people have is correct that uh, – when we begin to get richer in a poor country, we do more things and we do more things with old, dirty technologies. So we produce more stuff and we transport more stuff and there's a lot of pollution. Um, we can see that in Beijing. We can see that in New Delhi today as they get richer. But there's something interesting about that. New Delhi and Beijing are the most polluted places. It's not New York. It's not London, which it used to be when they, those places got rapidly richer before because something happened on after they got rich. They began to change their preferences. They began to think that perhaps we should deal with environmental problems as well. Um, and they got the money, the resources to do that. In a poor country, if you have the choice between making sure that you have food on the table for your kids, that you can send them to school, or try to protect the forest and the river, that's not a choice. It's obvious what you'll do. Um, but after a certain level, you begin to think of that and you get the uh, resources to do it. You get the technology to do this in, in a better way. So many researchers talk about a, a, an environmental Kuznets curve, an inverted U, uh, letter, the letter U, um, where pollution and environmental degradation increases rapidly as countries get richer. But after a certain point, that begins to change. You begin to deal with waste problems. You reduce pollution. Um, in Britain, in the US, in Europe, we've reduced the six leading pollutants, the ones that uh, poisoned our lungs and our forests and so on, by 60 to 70 percent in the last uh, four decades. So we do see incredible um, progress when it comes to in the environment in the richest countries. If you look at the data from things like the Environmental Sustainability Index, you can see that the ones that are the most sustainable are often the richest countries, whereas the, the, it's Haiti and Mozambique and Zimbabwe that are, are the worst um, polluters um, because they, do not ha they haven't gone through this transition yet. A lot of people would say that, well, yeah, this is you stupid libertarians. This is government that did this. They passed laws that said that cars had to have catalytic converters and put in emission standards and a bunch of other things, coal scrubbing and things like this. Um, that seems to be part of it, but that's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. And often when you look at the data, that began to change before the government began to step in, uh, partly because of better technologies uh, that we could produce more things with less resources and less uh, uh, pollution. And um, the more modern sectors of the economy, they, and they had a rapid turnover of technology and equipment so that they can, could do that uh, faster. But it's also the case that pollution in itself is uh, kind of an intrusion in somebody else's property rights, somebody else's uh, health. I think it was Karl Marx who pointed out that uh, this is actually contrary to capitalism if you ruin somebody else's property, somebody else's land and, and so on. And uh, in a perfect market, you'd be able to go to the court and get compensation. Um, now, in a, in a, I think that would be a preferable uh, situation, but you can imitate that. And that's often what the government has done. Um, they try to impose fines then on polluters. They try to implement various systems to make sure that we reduce this. It's not perfect. Uh, there are some real problems uh, when they do this. But I think that something similar would have happened on the market because preferences change. And as you see the problems, you begin to implement property rights that really weren't there before. So well, it takes in voters have to start demanding environmental goods as some things that they like, which is a product of wealth to begin with. As you said, if the first question is, uh, are, where are we going to eat tomorrow? But after you get through that question, you can start saying, well, I want to eat in a clean air environment and that changes. Of course, the so wealth is a product of that. But that brings up the question of global warming, which is yeah. a concern of many, many people. Um, but you write that it may not be just as simple as choosing the eradication of emissions or things like this. It may actually be about wealth creation too to help solve this problem. Yeah. Well, I happen to think that global warming goes on and that human beings is partly responsible through greenhouse gases. I'm not an expert there, but I listen to the experts and that's what they say. I agree. Uh, so, so that's why I have to 
Um, so so does so does Pat Michaels, who's our yeah. I mean, it is a man-made thing, but but now the question is, what do we do about exactly. it? Exactly, and. That does not mean that we know what will happen, the kind of consequences that will result from this. There's a wide difference between the various scenarios uh, in here. Um, but I think the sort of uh, stable mainstream scenario, uh, let's point that out first of all, that the sort of the UN climate pa- on, on, uh, panel uh, puts in their basic, base scenario, is not apocalyptic. It creates problems, uh, marginally a higher sea level. We'll see uh, perhaps some tropical diseases will move a bit north. We'll see uh, perhaps an increase in uh, floods in certain places and so on. In other words, the kind of problems that we already see around the world and that we saw during the 20th century as well. And then the lesson is where could we deal with that in a good way? Well, in industrialized rich societies that had the technology and had the um, were prepared to deal with those things. And that's exactly what every scenario says. The countries that will suffer the most are the poorest countries. So whatever we do now, any kind of system put in place that would stifle and block their economic development would lead to human tragedy in those places. They need more wealth to be able to deal with these things. Um, so that's the first thing that has to be pointed out. And if we have a stable rate of growth in, in the world, some 2% per capita per year, it means that in 100 years we'll be some seven times richer than we are today. Now, what would that mean if we have seven times the wealth of today, perhaps seven times uh, the technology at our disposal, the resources at our disposal? It would probably mean that it would not be a piece of cake, but it would be much easier to deal with those problems and any other kind of problems that will appear, no matter what we do um, about global warming, than if we didn't have that wealth. We need that to go further. But we can also do other things. That would also make it possible for us to use these new technologies that are uh, being implemented in certain places or at least are in the laboratories, but are now much too expensive to roll out on a global level. Um, If it's too expensive, what do we do? Well, we need more purchasing power so we can afford it, more technological development so that it comes down in price. And that could be everything from uh, better solar um, power. Um, I mean, there are a lot of libertarians, including me, who complain about the subsidies for for, uh, solar power. Uh, But that's because they're totally... Uh, re- uh, reactionary in a way. They only subsidize the kind of technology we have today so that we have these ineffective solar panels being produced on a larger scale. That's not what we want. We want the next generation uh, of great solar panels from perhaps graphene, this incredibly thin material that we could sort of have our roads, our buildings, everything. Our sort clothes, of built in, yeah, heard, yeah, exactly. it's, pr- it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, or it could be the next generation of nuclear power, or it could be a better generation of biofuel, not the old ethanol, but get it from uh, algae, uh, which would certainly take care of many of the, our environmental problems. Or it could even be taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We know how to do that. It's punishingly expensive to do that. But what do you do if, if something is punishingly expensive? More technological development, more wealth. Uh, so in other words, it's the opposite of some of what the sort of reactionary greens say, that we have to dismantle industrial society. No, we need more progress to deal with this. And we need more people coming out of poverty, going to school, becoming smarter so they can start thinking about how to solve these problems and use what Julian Simon called the ultimate resource, which is human ingenuity, that you, there's – Things are not resources until we figure out how to turn them into resources. And one of the things you write about is literacy is just skyrocketed around the world. And so some of these people can start studying how to make the next nuclear reactor. How 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 much has literacy changed? Yeah. Wow. Two hundred years ago, it was one in ten people could read and write around the world. Now it's the opposite. It's one of ten cannot uh, read and write in a population that has sort of exploded as well, a dramatic population growth, uh, which means that and, and much of that progress has been made quite recently, especially when it comes to girls and their ability to get an education, which is important in other ways as well. Uh, fertility comes down where, as, as women uh, get more access to education and, and knowledge. And then we don't have a, 
overpopulation question if if female That's literacy, right. literacy goes Fertility up. Fertility rates has been halved basically in the last half century. Uh, so, uh, and this is important because as you point out, everything is connected here. Uh, all those problems that we do not know how to deal with, for example, global warming, What what do you do when you cannot solve a problem? Well, you need more eyeballs looking at it, and you need more brains working on this. And now this, I mean, I, I met young girls in the Saharan desert who goes to school for the first time, and they get an access, a connection to the internet. So for the first time, they can compare notes. They get access to the accumulate knowledge of mankind. Imagine what these hundreds of millions of people who are now coming online for the first time, what they can do when they think about these problems, they get access to this knowledge and they can use the resources at their disposal to begin to deal with those problems. So literacy is one of the most important factors behind my optimism about the world. And then and you have also discussed freedom. Um, slavery is down. Well, not, it's down. It used to be disturbingly common, pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and also, there are fewer walls in the world. Well, until you know, maybe maybe, so maybe, maybe when by the time listen they're to listening us. to this, Trump will have already built yeah. a wall and made Mexico pay for. It. But there are fewer walls um, uh, around the world. Fewer places blocked off by they say the Eastern Bloc, and that seems to be a positive development too, especially for trading um, and. Equality is another one you discuss, which I think is is a thing. These are ones at, at the end, which are very important, but I think some that people might be a little bit more familiar with. Freedom yeah. is up, equality is up, women's rights, gay rights. Um, is racism down? Would you say like the, the actual sentiments of racism? Well, the ways that we have in in trying to measure this is you have to look first of all at things like uh, the kind of. Um, uh, political rules and regulations that are in place. Do they condone or condemn discrimination, segregation and so on? And then you can see that all over the world it's come down dramatically over the last uh, half century. Uh, it used – the worst examples that we have today in the world used to be a everyday occurrence in, in a lot of developed countries. I mean um, a bit more than half a century ago we had racial segregation instituted in the United States. Um, but you can also measure it by looking at people's attitudes to uh, minorities, to other groups and so on. And then you can see that uh, those attitudes have had have also shifted dramatically. We notice it now when we hear things like uh, Donald Trump's comments about uh, Mexican immigrants and and others. Uh, but that we wouldn't have noticed that 50 years ago because that's something that almost everybody thought in those days. If you look at the attitude to for example, interracial marriage or what would you do if uh, African-Americans moved in uh, next doors? Uh, you had majorities of white people saying that they would leave, that they would condemn an interracial marriage and so on. Now, that almost does not exist. And in the youngest generation, that's totally gone. So we do see progress. But now and then people exploit this. Uh, now and then people try to stir up those uh, emotions. And I think that Trump's campaign is is an example of that. We see some of that in, when it comes to the nativist uh, sort of right-wing populism in Europe as well. And I think that's bad. I think that's scary. There's always a risk of a uh, downward spiral as well when you begin to set groups against each other in, in that way. But in fact, if you listen to what they say and what they are very clear on that they are not saying because they're also very sort of sensitive in saying, no, I'm, I absolutely do not think that uh, I'm not a racist in that sense. I'm not a racist it, but one of them. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's something entirely different uh, from what you heard half a century ago and what's acceptable to the average Joe in the street. So. This, this, these trends are incredible. Uh, they need to be known. Uh, anyone should definitely read this book to just have a good idea of what's going on in the world in order to be able to formulate accurate opinions about what should be done and, and what should be done in the future. Uh, but there will be a lot of people who criticize it to say that you're missing some things by sort of championing the, the capitalism element of this to bring about these great changes. We're missing things like spiritual growth, like that we're – 
a less connected society, that we're more alienated from each other because of capitalists telling us to go buy, buy, buy and to run the rat race and try and make as much money and we don't talk to our neighbors anymore and we have a lot of social problems that, that are also a product of this growth. How would you respond to that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's important to note that uh, don't look – we shouldn't look to an economic or political system to solve all, all our existential problems. Um, there's this sense that uh, if you tell people that, look, we're, we're eradicating poverty, they tell you so, – sort of, so you think everything is fine? No, that's not what I'm saying. And We'll still have other problems and perhaps new problems as well. Um, as the old proverb goes um, – if you um, if you don't have food, you have one problem. But if you have food, you have a thousand problems <laughs> because you're not constantly obsessed with getting putting food on the table, and then obviously other things will will be there. Uh, when it comes to trying to measure what happens to society, to um, uh, the uh, uh, kind of communities that we live in, um, it gets a little bit more complex because some of the traditional ways in which we used to interact uh, have been reduced, often in organized forms, in, in groups, you know, the traditional bowling alone phenomena. Uh, yeah, we do not bowl in an organized way in a, an organization with uh, in, uh, in different championships and so on. But people do bowl with their friends. They go there and they interact socially and they do other things socially, um, but not in those organizations, but we also build new communities in, in those regards. I'm a bit uh, sensitive to uh, attempts to say that we, we're getting sort of alienated because everything is about the economy, everything is about uh, creating wealth. I think that one of the major benefits from making more money is that you can care a little bit less about money. And that's what we see when it comes to the values people hold. If you are poor, you have to use every interaction to try to get something immediately. And you're um, sort of at least metaphorically speaking willing to sell your mother for, um, for a few bucks. Um, when we get richer, we begin to think of other things. We talked about the environment before, but also uh, foregoing attempt to get something materially because we already have a lot of things. Um, so there have been many interesting experiments with various groups around the world and to see how their values change if they have a lot of exposure to exchange, to trade and so on. And the strange and counterintuitive fact is that people have more experience from trade and competition. They are more generous in social interactions than others. It seems that the very fact that they meet others regularly, meet strangers regularly and negotiate and trade with them means that they have to take the other person's perspective into account. And that begins to change your values as well. Whereas those who don't, they use any interaction to try to get whatever they want. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Mark McDaniel and Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.